I was running my own business, uh, doing video editing and motion design stuff for 10 years and, you know, working for other people for a few years before that. So I've been using After Effects for like 16 years or something like that. Um, I know it pretty well. And uh, I'm pretty excited about uh, multi-frame rendering because it's uh, way faster. It's uh, as as one of my uh, co-workers, Ryan Summers, who tweets about this kind of stuff a lot, um, said earlier, this is, this is kind of what we've been promised for several years and it's finally here and it's awesome. It's so much faster. And I'm Ian Sansvera. I am by day, I'm the director of post-production for Team Liquid, which is one of the largest esports organizations in the world. And by night, uh, you may have seen my face on YouTube under Learn How to Edit Stuff, where I teach Adobe After Effects and Premiere tutorials to all those people learning out there to edit better, do motion design better. I'm not going to compete with Kyle. He's going to talk about all the, oh, it's this way. Weird, Kyle, <laughs> uh, the motion design stuff. But yeah, uh, any editing related post-production stuff uh, is me. And uh, yeah, that's that's a little about me. And I'm excited also to talk about multi-frame rendering because it is something that we've been promised for a while. There was an attempt at it earlier, uh, right? Where it was like opening up several instances of After Effects in the background and it was like exciting kind of, but now it's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's even been around still. Like there's all those plugins, like what is it? Render Garden, BG Render Max. There's a there's a third one I can never remember. Um, but yeah, I, that, that's how they I work. I remember it's Render basically Garden. Because I liked like yeah. the it was like seeds are the CPU instances mm -hmm. and then the gardeners are like the the processes or whatever. I was like, oh, that's yeah, it's something. I like remember that. from that. That's <laughs> yeah, that's neat. but oh, yeah, sorry. like you said, how those work is they actually launch multiple instances of After Effects in the background, and so like RAM usage goes up linearly with how many threads. Um, you know, same with like VRAM and all this other stuff. So like, yeah, it can scale, but it can't scale nearly as much as I think a lot of people think. Right? You know, they think like, oh yeah, I have a twenty core CPU or you know, 16 core CPU, I can do 16 times faster. It's like, nah, it usually actually tops out at like three or four times faster. Yeah. And you try Which to click on good. one tab in your internet browser and like your whole computer just like lags out. And you're like, well, okay, I should probably stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but well, multi-frame rendering, like as far as I can tell, you can get similar performance or, or a little bit better, except it doesn't have to like eat everything. <laughs> yeah. And they give us a nice little UI update with the with the export. Yeah. You know, the buttons are new, mm -hmm. they're rounder. It's like a nice little like color. <laughs> Ooh, I know. It's like stuff like that I shouldn't get excited about, but it excites me. You know, it's nice to see like a little visual update to After Effects after all these years. That one yeah. little export queue. So nice. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a couple of things that came along for the ride with this that I'm really excited to talk about too. Like, I mean, faster renders are are awesome, obviously, and faster previews, but some of the other things that came along, like uh, the um, cache frames while idle and the composition profiler where you can kind of see which layers are heavy. Uh, like yeah, or here, that, I, that, I think I oh, have man. After Effects up. Here's some, you just want to switch my shirt. I can just show these while you're talking about it. Nice. Yeah, I'm sorry I mean, the, for the brand. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, but. <laughs> um, so uh, what what you'll see, uh, just kind of what I was mentioning here, um, a couple things that kind of got rolled into this. You know, you've got faster exports and faster previews. Like already, that's just awesome, right? But as part of this, while we're sitting here talking, After Effects is going ahead uh, and just building the preview of his timeline. He's not manually doing that. It's just assuming that you're going to want that to preview, and so it just starts building it. Which yeah. is obviously super handy. Um, you know, even on a heavy timeline, you step away to get your coffee and you come back and it's already ready. I was gonna say it um, happened to me. I went to the bathroom, I opened up After Effects <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm gonna jump in, but before I get started, I'm gonna go run to the bathroom real quick. I came back and it was hard. I was like, What the hell? This is great. I mean, you know, if you're if you're an old timer like uh like us, I'm sure you've you know, you kind of already trained yourself, like, okay, I'm going to get coffee, I'm gonna, you know, hit the preview and it'll be going when I come back, but eh, yeah, I don't even have to remember anymore. Yeah, the muscle. Yeah, the weird muscle memory of uh, <laughs> of being disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's a pretty cool thing, and that that's one that I think is very important as well as with mm -hmm. uh, MFR because before you would do this and like it wouldn't be able to get through very much before you know you hit play and then it have it it wouldn't get too far ahead. But with MFR now, it can get really far ahead. I mean, you saw this one like this is a yeah, it's, it's not too heavy. But still, like it can do the whole thing for you while you're just like sitting here thinking about what how you want to apply an effect or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, yeah and then the other one you mentioned how it slows everything down the audio if you're ever working with any footage and it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's always fun, but not anymore. Yeah, and then the <laughs> other one you talked about the composition profiler that's what all these uh bars are down here. Yeah, I love um, you might not be able to see it, gives you a total frame, uh, like how long it took. 
and then it can tell you which layers. So you can know like, oh, okay, this guy's a problem. <laughs> and you know, you can disable it or you can take a look at it and figure out why it's doing what it's doing or yeah. you know, whatever. And and that does layers, effects, expressions, masks. Uh, I mean, pretty much every little sub thing that you might see in there. Um, as I recall, you know, it's not necessarily per property, but um, yeah. you, you know, sort of per thing that you might add onto a layer, you can see what's what's slowing things down. And um, you, you know, there, there's times where that's really useful. Uh, I, I did a lot of manual sleuthing to work that stuff out <laughs> in, in days of yore. So it's nice <laughs> to be able to see like kind of empirically, like, yes, that's the slow layer. Definitely. Maybe that's a good one to pre-render or find a different way to achieve that look. Yeah. Does it work on solo layers? Like if you solo layer, will it only affect the solo layer or does it still do background process? Is there a key, sure. keyboard shortcut for solo, solo, solo uh, the layer? The, can you, uh, on the side there, right, the little dot next to the lock, not the eye, the one right next to it on the right. Yeah. So click yeah, the, bo yeah, the box. Yeah. The box. Yeah. The box for the, the box for the dot. Go down next to your eyeball. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, oh. oh. Well, I, I'm so confused. Go straight down. <laughs> All right, so you know where the eye box is? Yeah, so click right. Yeah, you, yeah okay, so go right to the right, directly to the right. Keep going. Oh, oh yes. I see. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's so hard to like. Okay, uh, it should probably be more like this. Uh, yeah, it looks like it does. So if you're still in a layer, it'll update it. Oh, cool. great. Yeah, Which I makes sense because really that's. That. Yeah. It, it's funny because it's like this kind of thing will change the way that you work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something really interesting about multi-frame rendering. Not very many updates will fundamentally change your workflow, but I feel like that one for me has a, a little bit already, but like definitely will in the future as well. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I can just turn off my problem layers. And I started doing that cause I've been working a lot in Blender doing 3D stuff. And I just hide a lot of my eye candy and just work on the one thing that I want to yeah. work on. And so I started doing that like subconsciously in After Effects. And now that I can see all those layers that are giving me problems, it's like going to just, you know, integrate itself more into the workflow, which is so nice. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that's really nice with composition profile I've been thinking about is um, they're pushing motion graphics templates a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and anything you're going to bring into Premiere work, if you're going to have a lot of people using the same thing over and over and over again, you can use this to try to figure out like, yes. Okay. This, this, should I use this effect or that effect? Cause like you could use what Colorama tent, Lumetri, and so you might decide, okay, I'll just throw all three on and see which one is faster. And you can just see it at a glance rather than not having to time anything. So yeah. You, you can that, really yeah. optimize things that are going to be used over and over and over by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a really great good. example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny because like, After Effects yeah. people will probably get mad at me for saying this, but I use the Essential Graphics panel way more in Premiere than I do in After Effects. Like I build out all the templates in Essential Graphics, but then I don't really have the Essential Graphics panel open in After Effects. It's mainly in Premiere. So that's mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely an interesting way to like cross check. I wonder mm -hmm. if it. Hmm, now I'm thinking like, okay, well, does Lumetri color work better in Premiere than Tint would in After Effects? Like, is there is there cross functionality there? Interesting. It should if it's done in After Effects. Any anything that's in that motion graphics template should be using the After Effects rendering. Engine. Right. Yeah. It's not using so, anything in the background of Premiere. Right. It's all it's all yeah. After Effects. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's is one of the point. reasons I should why actually, I like. I should do that. We do that for work. I mean, we have. Adobe libraries for everything, literally mm -hmm. everything. We have like our editor toolkit that has like sound effects and intro bumpers, outro bumpers, like everything is in there. So uh, if I ever get some spare time, which is very rare these <laughs> days, I'll go back through and I'll cross check everything. It's probably worth doing. Sounds yeah, like you're know, working we're smart. <laughs> trying to. I'm trying. It's yeah. like, you know, a lot of people are afraid to lean into the technology of the, of the mm -hmm. day, right? Like you, you're set in your ways, you have your workflows and all these other things. And people are afraid to venture outside of their comfort zone. And I think that's so fundamentally wrong. Like, I, I feel like people should still try it just to form an opinion whether or not they like it. You know, yeah. like all this AI stuff, I keep getting messages from everybody. They're like, AI, they're going to take editors' jobs. And I'm like, no, they're not. It's just going to become this yeah. tool that now I can use over somebody else, which is going to make me more valuable and like make me look, you know, a little bit better at the end of the day. Because I'm now using AI rotoscoping or whatever to like do this right. thing that you're still doing manually for some reason. People got to stop being afraid of this stuff. It's Maybe really cool. you could spend, you know, a little bit less of your day going through raw footage because, you know, a computer can make even just some very basic selects for you or something like, yeah, how does that not sound useful? No, it's it's right. totally useful. And, you know, I'm working on a project right now that just has like a million takes and it's all shot on red, all in 8K. And like having an AI 
integration into Premiere to like literally cut all of my clips directly when the slate hits like would be amazing. Like, so there's not just like stuff at the beginning, right? It just starts from the slate so I can instantly see the take numbers and all that stuff. Like that's not something I want to do manually. I want a nice. robot to do that. But that okay. robot's not going to take my job. You know, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't know how to sense like, you know, emotion or anything. Well, not yet. Hopefully never. The singularity. Well, supposedly, I mean, they do technically <laughs> can it can do like emotion of like people's faces, but it's not going to give you the emotion of like the scene. Yeah, yeah, but, and like facial training, right? Like if I wanted to like catalog data and just like meta tag everything, dope. Have a robot yeah. do that, but yeah. like I don't want to do yeah. that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's like the goal of automation in general, right? Is to is to ease the like tedious, like repetitive manual tasks that we do. Yeah. Uh, and, and so why not? That that gives you to focus. It gives you the opportunity to focus more on the sort of fuzzy creative side of things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is really tough to like program for. It's what I say this all yeah. the time on my YouTube channel is time is the most valuable asset that we all have, not even as creatives, but as human beings. Right. And so anything that you can do to save time is more time that you can spend with your family, more time that you can spend making coffee, which I love to do. Uh, and like multi-frame rendering is definitely doing that too, right? Where yeah. there used to be this nostalgia of like, you know, some people I'll go out and have a cigarette or I'll go make some coffee while I'm rendering. Like it's really fast it's now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not drinking as much coffee as I used to. I'm not going on as many walks as I used to, but that's also a good thing because it then it compounds and then ends up at the end of your day or whatever. So yeah, yeah, it's all yeah. You, you can still get up and take a walk and drink your coffee and stuff. You just not, waiting on your machine also yeah. yes but you tell people that you're waiting on your machine that's right. the whole allure right it's like oh, i gotta render but really you're like just sitting there playing playing something on your phone or whatever don't <laughs> yeah. tell anybody i said that i'll know it i'll know before, it got out before we go even any further i could you mind if i i show a quick demo of like what multi-frame brain kind of does in terms of performance because oh, like, yeah, we talked sure. about how like it's amazing but like i don't know if the people who haven't seen it yet they might not quite get mm -hmm. how good mm -hmm. it, it is. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because um, I think this will this will hit on uh, Ryan Summers from YouTube who's asking, tell me more about <laughs> MFR, Kyle. Is it real? Is it really fast? You're about to see right now. Yeah. The aforementioned Ryan Summers. <laughs> he knows the um, answer so to that the, question already. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so before I hit play, uh, just a couple things. This is obviously pre-recorded. You can't show things live, and my computer's not good enough to show you the best case. Uh, but uh, on the left here is with multi-frame rendering, and this has Task Manager up, so you can kind of see what the CPU load is. Yeah. On the left, or on the right, sorry, is the older single frame rendering, what we have now, basically. And so also you can watch the CPU load over here and you'll notice that it's just one core basically that kind of jumps around versus multi-frame rendering. So this is the same exact comp. Uh, Kyle, this is actually the one you made for yep. uh, showing off MFR. Uh, it's the same frame count, same everything. So I'll just hit play. And you can see just like how much more of the CPU is being used consistently. And then you can also see the progress bar going across. Uh, it actually stops halfway. They redid the UI. So halfway versus all the way. Uh, green is what it is render rendering at the same time. So it's actually telling us concurrent frames rendering. I think it says eight. It's, it's kind of small. Eight or nine or something like that. So on this system with this composition, it's able to do eight to nine frames at the same time versus just one. So I think that's finishing there. Uh, this is sped up, but real time would be done in about a minute. And this other one, I think it... I think I put up a text the thing that comes up, but it's like four minutes or something. And like mm -hmm. we don't have to sit here and wait for it because I Let's don't want do to it. Sit make here everybody else. Minutes. There we go. The pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to, yeah. We'll just stay on this for four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so serious. that that's like that's like the, one of the best cases we found was like four and a half. I think the highest we got was like four point seven, so almost five times faster, uh, which is like absolutely Huge. nuts. And, and that's not just for rendering too. Like um, like Render Garden we were talking about before or BG Render Max, that's exporting only. Um, mm -hmm. Multi-frame rendering will do playback. So like preview as well. Um, and you know, there again, you can see anywhere from like two to five times performance increase, which is absolutely nuts. Yeah. A um, couple other places though, I don't think people might realize is uh, we we're talking about motion graphics templates. Uh, it should be used in Premiere Pro if you're using motion graphics templates. Uh, same thing with like media encoder. Mm -hmm. If you're like going through media encoder, it should use an MFR too. So that's mm -hmm. why it's a big deal is like, that's just nuts performance. Like the, And those are all places hardware, where you're gonna feel it. Yeah, yeah, it, it basically should, I, I haven't done actually the math, but it should make a system from like six or seven years ago as be as fast as like the highest end workstation, hmm. you know, 
basically it kind of shifts that. and then you know that high-end workstation is going to get way faster too right but it yeah. basically upgrades your system like five years into the future when you as soon as you update which is again pretty That's incredible nuts. Yeah, I get those comments all the time on my YouTube channel. Oh, I'm using a whatever. It's like super low. It's like, yeah, this will help you. Trust me. I see somebody uh, asking. Oh, wait, no. Yes, you can install it in beta. So you can install AE beta from the Adobe Creative Cloud uh, desktop app. And you can just install After Effects beta. And then you go into your settings and you go to preview. And then you can enable multi-frame rendering in the uh, in your menu, in your options. Yeah, so if you want. Should I can even show you where the beta is real quick if you want. Um, Hell yeah. By the way, I yeah. didn't know that Kyle, I did well, first of all, this is the first time I've ever met Kyle. Second of all, I didn't know that you made that benchmark project. Beautiful work. Thanks. As soon as they sent it to me, because I did a video on it and I used your video in my in my video. <laughs> and I was like, this is a great project. So kudos to Kyle. Thanks. Um uh yeah, so here's your Creative Cloud desktop app. And if you look right here on the left side, there's this little beaker thing that says beta apps. And uh they have beta apps available for quite a few things. So uh, you can see I have all the video related ones installed. There's also Photoshop and Illustrator and Character Animator and Audition. So if you want to be kind of ahead of the curve on this stuff, um, you can. And you just have to install them. And then they'll they'll be releasing, I think we kind of said this, but you know, they release new builds like maybe every couple days. Uh, it it kind of varies. Sometimes it's you know, next day if if there's something that needs to be fixed. Um, but you have access to all these features, you know right now and it, um, and it yeah. installs alongside right yeah. you have <laughs> i have the current release and i have the beta you can see it has this kind of like blueprinty uh sort of icon and and if you could see my desktop icons which i turned off um <laughs> for this uh you can see it's it's different um so here's the wherever n the normal after effects and then the, the beta one is you know the white and white and blue yeah. so I've got them, but I was talking to these guys before we actually started the broadcast that I actually prefer to use the beta version over the normal build because of how often they update it. Mm -hmm. And they're fixing these little things that, you know, you might get annoyed with in the main build because their engineers are just like staying on top of the beta stuff uh, much more frequently than the normal builds. Uh, this is not advice. I wouldn't advise you to do all of your projects in the beta build. I do because I'm a psychopath, but I like seeing the little, the little changes and the little nuanced things that you notice over the course of, you know, a couple weeks, a month that they make to the program. It's really, really awesome. And they're prioritizing that, which is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a great and way to see you, the, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you mentioned how it installs alongside and um, you actually can though use projects back and forth. So technically mm -hmm. if you bring a project into the beta, if you start having problems, you could save and then go back to the original. I wouldn't recommend that either. Just like you said. It I've happens accidentally copy, too, because but... I've gone to open stuff uh, in what I thought was the normal After Effects build. And then all of a sudden it opens a beta. None of my plugins are installed because I haven't done it yet. And it's like, oh God. But yeah, you can you can prioritize. You just right click, go to open with, and then choose the right mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. Assuming you're all PC master race, which if you're <laughs> tuning into a Puget Systems live, which I would assume at this point. <laughs> Uh, what I'd were you like gonna to say, Kyle? Oh. What Sorry, was I gonna say? Um, I don't remember. Uh, I'm sure it was okay. really brilliant, and we're, we're very sad to have missed it. <laughs> um, I did want to grab this one question from uh, from YouTube from Joe Kunitz. Uh, he asks, "Will render and replace in Premiere use the multi frame rendering?" Do we know? I don't it know. Should. I would assume so. Yeah, if, if it's actually an After Effects, like you know comp or a motion graphics template it would i mean if it's just a normal you know premiere pro thing no but anything that is after effects and using the after effects rendering engine is supposed to be able to use it i i'm still not 100 percent clear on how that's going to work because there's some settings in Same. like after effects that you can set like uh one of the settings you can say is how much of your cpu to reserve because mm -hmm. uh, multi-frame mm -hmm. rendering can use all of your cpu which is good in theory, bad in practice because <laughs> you got other you things don't to do. Want your, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got other things for your computer to do. Uh, so you can set it. I think by default it reserves ten percent, uh, but like I don't know how that works with Premiere Pro and Media Encoder because there's no settings about that. Yeah, that's yeah. a great question because a, a lot of the times I'm I'm a madman and I I live inside of Dynamic Link. Like and I I. <laughs> Adobe, please <laughs> throw some more resources at Dynamic Link because it, it really is spectacular. But yeah, I'm, I'm in Premiere and I'm right clicking, uh, replace with After Effects composition. I'm going in there, working on titles, doing a bunch of stuff. And so, yeah, it's an interesting question because 
I don't know if it actually does. Um, I'm also kind of a psycho and I just pre-render everything. I'll replace with After Effects composition because that's the easiest way to get everything in with accurate time code. I'll do my work and then export out of After Effects and then bring it back into Premiere. Because yeah, know. I, I'm <laughs> hoping supposed to be able at to Adobe. Play, but... I was just say, I'm hoping at Adobe Max. That's next week, isn't it? Next yeah. week it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tuesday, I'm hoping Thursday. at Adobe Max they'll because um, I mean all the stuff is in beta. We don't know what parts are going to be coming out of beta. What parts are going to stay in beta? You know, because there's a bunch of things they've been changing, uh, mm -hmm. both in Premiere Pro and After Effects. And um, so hopefully we'll hear a little bit more than um, you know about how some of this stuff is is going to work because. Yeah, right now it's a little nebulous on some of them. Somebody will slip up. Somebody always reveals some trade secret accidentally, and they're like, "I wasn't supposed to say that." It'll happen. So keep yeah, I mean the the <laughs> thing I love about the beta though is it means that there's very little in the way of like trade secrets. Like I think Photoshop yes. still has like a private beta you know level. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Premiere and After Effects do anymore. I think the beta is just it. You um, can so it's pretty uh, much you can like. Shift Alt Control F4 click on the little beaker in After Effects and enter in a secret code if if the After Effects people give it to you and you can demo mm -hmm. new features. Which is pretty. There's cool. still some secrets. There's but, some secrets. Uh, yeah. yeah, just, just sure. things yeah. that aren't quite well, ready for the public beta yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I, I know with the multi frame rendering stuff, I'm sure there was because they they multi frame rendering was a long road to get here. Um, even yeah. a couple of months ago, there was like a really long startup times, like with preview, especially you'd hit space mm -hmm. bar and you'd have to wait like five or six seconds before it'd start to play. Yeah. Like that wasn't fun, but you know, they fixed that, you know, they had to go in and, and you know, I don't know what they did, but you know, a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a long way, but it, it definitely feels stable now to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited. You know, I'm assuming it's going to be launched with, uh, you know, to next week, you know, officially, but same. I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, officially. None I mean, of us are from Adobe, it. so we we can't make any promises on their behalf. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> I, I will be stunned if this is not uh, publicly released next week. Yeah, me too. And, and same with all the other features. What's it? There's a render notification, speculative mm -hmm. preview, uh, composition profiler, and mm -hmm. MFR. Those are like the big four. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, I'd be stunned if any of those aren't. And there's another one, scene edit detection. I think they finally yes. added into After Effects too. Oh, really? Yes. yes. Which is nice. Yeah. yeah. Which is really nice, I think. As somebody who uses footage in After Effects quite regularly, uh, which such pain, even saying that. But yeah, I mean, having that is is really nice. When they added it to Premiere, it was nice. Yeah. And they, it was okay know, to like, hop over there and just you know drop some markers on it in Premiere and send it back. But um, <laughs> having having it straight in After Effects is great. Yeah. Yeah, that is great. That's nice. I'm still, okay, this is getting off topic a little bit here, but I still wish they would uh, make the proxy workflow better in After Effects. That's the one that like, they spent a lot of work on in Premiere recently, and like mm -hmm. it's pretty good. But After Effects, I feel like, is where you need it like a lot because footage, plays, it's just slower in, in After Effects than Premiere Pro. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but. it really is. But if you have a good computer, plug in Puget System, you don't really <laughs> need to use proxy. Even then, man. <laughs> <laughs> some of it, some of that stuff is just like you, you can some things like you can play just fine in Premiere, but you bring it into After Effects and it's like half FPS. Yeah. It's just how After Effects works. It's just doing yeah. prioritizing different things. Like so yeah. it makes sense. But I think yeah, it's worth you're going to use footage, use Premiere, right? Like I yeah. I get questions all the time. Like should I just edit in After Effects? Oh, no, please. No, you no. should not edit in After Effects. Yeah, yeah, you should do all of your effects after the fact in After Effects. Mm -hmm. You can do visual effects in After Effects, motion graphics in After Effects. Don't try to edit in After Effects. It's very cool. If, if you need to like trim one clip or like, you know, take a couple and just just kind of slide this around a little bit, that that's fine. But right. Especially <laughs> with dynamic link. Make... And you can literally just copy paste stuff back and forth between the two programs, by the way. Yeah. So Not particularly like that, clips, just mm -hmm. just open a, a a blank project in Premiere, do yeah. your thing, and then copy paste it over to After Effects if that's all you have to do. It it, you, it might be worth a shot. Um, while we're on the subject, uh, this can be a whole other rabbit hole, but just kind of a general note, if something's running too slow in both After Effects and Premiere, stop and think about the format that you're working with. If you're working with a really compressed format, you're making the computer work that much harder to create every frame because it's having to uncompress the thing before it shows it to you or it thinks about it and shows it to you. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're working with an MP4 and it's slow, maybe you should be working with an actual like, production format, not a delivery format. Same thing goes with like PNG sequences instead of, you know, something that isn't super compressed. 
-hmm. So, you know, the, uh, may, I, I don't know. I feel like, feel like I'm out here shaking my cane. Cause like, <laughs> you know, machines used to be so much slower and you just kind of had to know some of that stuff, but I feel like mm -hmm. it's less the case now. Um, so whatever, that was my soapbox moment. I mean, it's, no. it's a good thing to bring up for sure. I mean, it's 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 useful information because mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, somebody comes to me with a problem. It's like their sequence settings or something like that, right? Yeah. Where it's yeah. like, if you just know this stuff and educate yourselves, I understand that like we're all impatient and we just want to make cool things. But if you take the time to educate yourself and you know these kind of pitfalls to avoid, you're going to be able to save that precious time and you're not going to drive yourself insane and you're going to learn something. And then you can come on a podcast like this and drop some knowledge bombs that people didn't know, you know, it's all, it's all worth it in the end. And maybe now you can use the time that you're saving with multi-frame rendering to research that stuff. Boom. <laughs> you have a link to a blog Full circle. right now. That was perfect. <laughs> you know, I do have a link to a school motion article that I personally pinned uh, recently. And then uh, that also links to a live stream that we did on our channel that I hosted. Matt was on with me along with some of the After Effects team. And we talked about all this stuff too. So let's go. go. See, mm -hmm, you love mm -hmm. it. That was a that was a nice alley oop there, Kyle. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think I put the the correct link in the chat. If Great. Is yeah, there. I see it. <clears throat> right on. Um, I'm curious. Uh, so we took a little bit of notes before, before as we were preparing for this, and I'm curious how this is different from uh, Matt had put in a, a mention in our notes of render multiple frames simultaneously feature, mm -hmm. and and. Is that what you guys were talking about earlier, how it would spin up different instances of yes. After Effects kind of in the background in order to accomplish that? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. six years ago now when they removed it. It was like 2015. 2014, 2015, I mean, was, 2015 something like that. Yeah, It was version 2015.3, I remember. I don't remember what year that was because <laughs> it's always off. I think it yeah. actually was 2014 year. <laughs> but yeah, that was when they um, they added GPU acceleration. And mm. I, for whatever reason, they also removed it then. From what I understand, like it was problematic. Like it caused yes. a lot of problems, especially with like plugins and just like things not working. And uh, just like all those other plugins we were talking about before, like Render Garden and BG Render Max, um, it only worked on export. So mm -hmm. it was a brute okay. force approach. And I think that's okay as a brute force approach back when we only had like quad core CPUs. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that kind of brute force just doesn't quite scale well enough. So yeah, now that's yeah. why they had to go in and add true multi multi threading and all that. Um, I do want to though mention though that like those plugins like Render Garden and BG Render Max, those aren't going to go away. Like they're just going to be used more for what they were originally designed for, which was network rendering. So mm -hmm. you can oh. still use them to you know you've got a you know bunch of people compete with computers at the office. Why not, after they leave for the day, use them as a render node? Uh, you don't have to pay for an After Effects license for each one. I think you just have to like log in, uh, install After Effects, and I think there might be a setting you have to change now. I can't remember. Uh, but then after that, you don't have to be logged in or anything. So you can still use it for that, and you still get you know perfect scaling. You know, so that just makes your stuff even faster. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> yeah. Having yeah. used Render Garden myself, uh, it's yeah. I mean, I've used it on a couple really big projects like that that I just need to cram a bunch of stuff through. But for one person making stuff on one machine, like I'm, I'm probably not going to open it anymore because just the hassle of having to sit there and kind of tend, you know, several instances of the thing. Like uh, I don't know, for certain big projects, I might. But generally speaking. Uh, the kinds of improvements I'm seeing here probably mean I, I'm, I'm not going to look to those solutions uh, except in extreme cases myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice that it's it's built right in. Mm -hmm. I, I anticipate that becoming the case more and more in the future, right? Where it's like, I mean, I was having a conversation with some of the After Effects team a couple months ago. And I was like, why haven't you guys done something like Overlord? Like, why can't I bring stuff from Illustrator into mm -hmm. After Effects or whatever? And they kind of alluded to like, oh, down the road potentially, which like, I feel like those kinds of quality of life things that other really smart people who deserve a lot of credit are building. Uh, you'll start to see more and more of those pop up into After Effects. Hopefully, hopefully would be nice. Mm -hmm. Well, and if there's a plugin out there for it, you know, it totally could just be, you know, acquired, you know, just like what uh, Adobe just did with Frame.io, like, mm -hmm. Why build out your own thing when someone else is already doing something that does a great job? I oh, will just buy them. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. it's probably cheaper to buy people than to pay developers to like write something from scratch. <laughs> it's fine. I've been using Frame.io since they had like two employees at the company. I've been with them for a long time. And 
I recently had to call like their customer service or whatever and like strike up a conversation with somebody. And we were grandfathered in from like a long time ago. So we have this account that like isn't supposed to exist. And so I'm like <laughs> between a rock and a hard place of like, well, now I think I have to upgrade to the enterprise version because we're at that point now, which is going to be way more expensive. But uh, yeah, the, the frame out thing is great. Acquisitions. If they work smarter, not harder when you have Adobe money, you know? <laughs> I, I had a kind of a person, a question from myself. Um, oftentimes when we have these sorts of updates that save people tons and tons of time, um, it isn't, it isn't that like, Oh, I'm done and I can go home earlier. It tends to then, it tends to lead toward bigger, flashier, cooler stuff to fill up that same amount of time. Um, for the both of you, what has this changed for, for you guys? Like, does it, like, what are you able to do now with this that you maybe couldn't or would have said like, Oh, this is too much. Um, I maybe have sort of a correlation that uh, isn't necessarily an answer, but um, so I got fiber internet like five or six years ago now. Uh, I, I live in the city where Google Fiber put in their first uh, lines. Jealous. And, you know, as someone who works with big files, video files are large. Um, you know, if I'm working with a client that isn't local, you know, might be exchanging gigs back and forth. It's not exaggerating to say that I gained a day on every project. Because, you know, at the beginning of a project or the end, when you're downloading files from them or sending them the final, like it could take hours to send stuff back and forth. Or, you know, I, I have a, a project I'm working on right now. I still do a little bit of freelance stuff around my school motion stuff that has uh, 90 gigs of footage. Wow. And that would be a big thing to just download with a slower speed. I did it in, I don't know, less than an hour. Uh, 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 probably, I don't know matters of tens of minutes maybe sure. um and you know i can just push stuff in seconds um so that's all the more time to work on the project and make it cooler which maybe i want to do um i agree that you know uh tasks can tend to expand to fill the container that you give them um but uh i don't know if there's any answer to that <laughs> I mean, for for me and, and my staff and i tell them this too uh more time to experiment more time yep. to play around, like try yep. different chains of plugins, try something new, like learn, right? I don't care if you, for the rest. Of, so in this weird work from home environment, we're, we're all hybrid now, all of my editors, I have a team of 12. Um, we haven't gone into the office since March of 2020. And it's like, my, my rules are, as long as you get the project done to the quality level that I expect on the deadline that you're given, I don't care how you spend your time. You wanna go to the park for four and a half hours in the middle of the day, if you got your stuff done early, go for it, like all you. Uh, if you're not going to do that, and you're going to stay at your computer, learn, you know, I, I gave everybody a uh, subscription to masterclass. I'm like, go in, learn stuff, like go on YouTube, Ooh. learn stuff, experiment with stuff, make something cool. Uh, and that's the kind of time that has been given back to, mm -hmm. you know, the people that I work with, which has been really phenomenal because it's, you know, increased morale, it's, it's increased excitement. You kind of rejuvenate some of that passion for the creative and it, it's done, it's done a lot. And I think it will continue to do more, which is very exciting. Yeah, right on. I have an extension of that question. So I haven't experimented with this at all. Uh, so I don't quite know what the answer is, but uh, ha will multi-frame rendering uh, just let you also work at just at higher resolution? So instead of having to turn your preview, you know, down to quarter res or whatever, it should let you bump that up, you know, a, a step or two, right? And I have to imagine as people so. who work in After Effects every day, that's going to be a big quality of life, you know, just for while you're working in your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, as sort of a, an old timer, like I said before, I, you you have all those things like, oh, you're working at lower res or skipping frames or turning off that heavy layer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you'd probably start like trimming some of those habits out a little bit um, just because you might start seeing that uh, it's faster enough that you don't need to knock down the resolution when you're doing your little previews or whatever. Um, or, you know, like the inside is just, you, if you do have those habits built already, you might just be done that much faster and use the time for something better. Maybe, you know, not stare at your screen for 10 minutes uh, instead of watching the little bar fill up <laughs> as, as we've all done so do many times. you ever play a game where you just take your mouse and you kind of push the back of it <laughs> and you like try to get it to finish faster? I do that. Uh, I've <laughs> never done anything like that. That sounds crazy. <laughs> or you can pull it from the front like a little rope, you know, you can pull it from... <laughs> I do that too. Uh, cool. I always just move my mouse over it, put it on the end to make sure it's actually moving. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've done that yep. too. You're moving? <laughs> it is a marker. Yeah. You good, buddy? 
Um, does multi-framer, I mean, I don't know enough about the technical side of it, but like if you have 10 layers in your project, small project, 10 layers in your project, but you only make changes to one, do the other nine stay pre-rendered? Because I know that that was like kind of an annoying thing too, where you would move a solid, right? Or like scale something and then the rest of it would have to re-render. Do the other nine layers no longer have to be re-rendered? I don't think that this does that. I, at, we do have, as of maybe a couple years ago now, it does remember. So like if I made a change and decided that I didn't want it, if I hit undo, it does remember that yes. stuff that it had before, which mm -hmm. was also a huge quality of life improvement. Yeah. Um, so that you but weren't not having if you to move, right? If you have, uh, yeah, I don't think it's like a per layer there. awareness like that that mm -hmm. I that I know of. Adobe, if you're listening, it, <laughs> it does know some things. I know though, because um, I mean, I do a lot of performance test teams, and whenever I'm adjusting things, sometimes I'll make one small change, and I have to make sure I clear all my cache, or else the performance doesn't like it, it's not accurate. So there is at least some level of it remembers things and it caches things. I mean, even in, um, well, that's not really when you like delete or edit, but in the, the composition profiler, it does denote things that are cached with a star. Uh, so you know that like, hey, this 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 layer has been cached. Um, I think that's a little bit different, but it, it does remember some things, I know. But yeah, it'd be nice if it remembered like everything. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. How often should we be caching After Effects? Or Kyle, are you? I don't cache in the middle of a project or anything, but maybe Matt, you do it a lot you more. Mean for, purging it for yeah, for like purging the cache, just emptying it. Oh, um, I empty I, it constantly. Yeah. Same. <laughs> I usually that have this well, really? disabled, but well, that's because I'm doing performance testing almost all the time, so I yeah. don't want. But Kyle, cache. you do when you're working on like pretty motion graphic intensive projects. It depends on the project um, and, and what I'm doing. Um, yeah, it varies because I do uh, you know footage heavy projects sometimes too. Um, it just kind of depends. Uh, maybe this isn't helpful, but I can kind of feel when it's full. <laughs> and so then I check it and empty it when I yeah, same. I have a, I mean, I, I'm assuming you have a dedicated drive in your computer as well just yeah. for cash. Yeah. That's the move. Uh, for those of you listening out there, if you're running into some issues like that, having a dedicated M.2 drive in your, I mean, really any drive that's fast write speed, maybe Matt will correct me on that. But as soon as I got a dedicated M.2 in my computer for cache specifically, I noticed such huge improvements in in speed. It's it's kind of crazy. Well, and you can make it huge but, then too, and not worry about yeah. having yep. to share space with anything. Yeah, and you can. It's easy to clear cache. Like I know some people forget where. Like, oh, how do I clear my media cache database stuff? And well, hey, you just close After Effects and Premiere or whatever else you got, and you just go to the drive and just select just all delete it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll it'll remake the folder structures. That's yeah. Fine. I, I do wish on that now. topic, though, I, I wish that After Effects had the same cache management that Premiere Pro has now, because in Premiere Pro, they added the, uh, it'll delete things after X days, mm -hmm. or when okay. things get to a certain size, it starts clearing stuff out. After Effects just goes and goes and goes and goes until it's full, <laughs> and then yep. shows you, you know. Well, then it starts the trimming away old stuff uh, to, to make the new stuff. I will say yeah, it, it is actually... Nice if you do that yeah. ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, it is actually very easy to find in After Effects, but uh, uh, it's a thing that a lot of people don't realize is there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just under the Edit menu, Purge, and then you can choose all of it, or you know, just specifically like your image cache or, or your memory. Uh, and if you don't know yeah. the difference between them, just do both. It's fine. <laughs> there's there's also in uh, mm -hmm. Edit Preferences, Memory and Cache, because there's yes, that's can, like uh, the the disk cache stuff. Media uh, but there's cache, also yeah. the the media cache, so like where your files are. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so that you can also purge in mm -hmm. there, and that's you separate. That. And that that Only you want to purge games. more. My my beta is not set up properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's small. My production copy, yes. <laughs> but things like the media cache uh, that can actually cause like if you're just getting weird behavior in like After Effects or Premiere Pro. Oftentimes, clearing that, those kind of cache files mm -hmm. will, will will fix it, and it, it really just means the next time you open a project, like it's going to take a few seconds longer to open, and then it's fine after that. So, deleting those ones are also really good. Yeah, yeah. they're intended to be temporary files, so it's okay. Yeah, well, that's the other nice thing about having them on a, a separate drive, like you're talking about, Ian, is because um, those are all files that do lots of writes to the drive, and drives mm -hmm. have finite amount of writes that they can do before they can start to fail. And so by putting all of those things that make a drive fail sooner in one place, that's all temporary files. If the drive fails, like who cares? Like you, yeah. I mean, 
it matters, but like it'll just go back to the OS drive, you know, the default locations until you can replace the drive. Yep. You know, if that was on your OS drive and it caused the yeah. OS drive to fail, That's well, bad. hey, now you're down for right. days, weeks, whatever. Yeah. The most annoying part of the whole process is just opening the computer up and <laughs> sticking a new drive in there. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. I mean, drives have really good lifespans these days. Like modern SSDs are insanely reliable. Like I think they're more reliable than processors uh, now, which is nuts. I've, I was talking to so, somebody like, about that the other day. It's like, I I remember, I don't know how old you guys are. I'm, I'm going to be 33 in March, but like I very distinctly remember a time before the internet and then like the early stages of the internet and then now, right? Where it's like, I have a nine month old son and like he'll never know the pain of like when a gigabyte used to be a lot, right? Where it was like a, a whole gig? Gee willikers. It's like, I have a, a, the project that I just received yesterday is like 2.86 terabytes. It's like, okay, like that to me, like back then when I was growing up as a kid, like that's yeah. like unimaginable. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. The, the technology curve isn't as much of a curve as it is like a brick wall. Like you hit like, you know, <laughs> early 2000s and like mid 2000s and then just like goes straight up. It's just like, it's evolving so fast. It's really, mm -hmm. really awesome to see and experience. So all you kids out there with your yeah, dank flabbing iPhones never never know what a floppy disk is. Oh, Disgusting. you three D printed the save icon. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had a computer game when I was in. Uh, I was probably like eight or something. It was a dinosaur game, which was super cool, and it was on five and a quarter floppies, which are the the bigger ones the like this. Floppy yep, ones. actually floppy. Actually yeah, floppy. and uh, my friend, uh, the game like asked if he wanted to save. And he somehow managed to save over the game itself on that floppy because how else would you save anything except on a floppy disk, right? Yeah. Oh man! So enjoy, the good old enjoy days. your playstations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matt, maybe you, maybe you might have some insight into this. I know there's been some kind of funny business we've seen um, when when you get into really high core count um, CPUs. Uh, something about like logical processors and and whatnot and there's and it can cause some issues um if this is so much kind of reliant on those kind of higher core count processors is that going to be an issue yeah it still is okay. um so we did a whole bunch of testing uh, it was part of a project with adobe actually um and so we tested like every cpu out there that's you know mod current gen and uh we saw performance gains up to 32 cores but when you cross that barrier of 32 cores performance dropped I mean, in some cases, really, really, really badly. And yeah, your uh, logical processor groups is, is what it's called. It's uh, Windows can only handle 64 threads, which would be 32 cores because each one does hyper threading. Um, so basically 32 cores. And then after that, it has to split it up into two groups. And that's kind of working like um, like a dual Xeon kind of workstation that no one uses anymore because you just don't need it. But it kind of does the same thing. So you kind of like have two groups of cores. And so... Um, normally, like if memory is being used for one thread, uh, another core or thread can like access it. Uh, but when you split it up, now it has to like go across to get the memory and then go back. And so that just introduces a lot of overhead. And I don't think any Adobe apps are really good at handling multiple logical processor groups. Mm. And so that's why performance just tanks uh, right after that, even though it's trying to use 100% of the CPU. Um, it's just, it, it has issues. Uh, it's just, I'm sure they could do something about it. My bet, though, is that we're running out of memory bandwidth as well. Like, we're using so many cores now and so well that the CPU isn't a bottleneck anymore once we get above, I don't know, 24 or 32 cores. So it's probably not even them worth investing in. Um, mm -hmm. It's just because we need other things to be way faster before yeah. that's going to be, <laughs> you know, yeah. even to be usable. But yeah, 100% 100, 100 CPU load does not mean it's going to be perfectly scaling. I, I guess that's the other thing, too, is... It's diminishing returns. I think, oh, hey, do I have, uh, yeah, here, here, if you can do the screen thing. I'm good. I like charts. Here's one small chart. We have a lot more charts in, in our articles, but um, <laughs> so this is just performance gain over a six core. And you can see like, it's pretty good up till about 12 cores, like not quite double in the best, best case, but you know, pretty close. And then it kind of flattens out a bit. It becomes a little bit more, uh, yeah, just, just lower slope. And so you get less of a performance gain as, as you go up. Um, and actually, this green bar, Kyle, is your project. It's the best one we found for scaling, uh, <laughs> both with and without multi-frame nice. rendering. Nice. Uh, so the blue is the average. So like, because we test a lot of different stuff, and some of them are fairly light. Some of them, it's just trying to shotgun approach 
And so like you actually don't see a huge gain in like average normal composition. So that's why a lot of people, when you're just starting After Effects, there's no reason to invest in like a crazy CPU. Right. Just get a decent one and it's going to handle you for quite a while. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's when you get into these really complex things. And honestly, when you're in this level, your time is money, probably most likely. And so investing in something like even like a Xeon, like they're really expensive. But for someone at this level, like the return on your investment is often, you know, very reasonable. You know, it, it might look ridiculous to someone, you know, who is just getting started in it or who, who aren't in this industry to see that like, oh, yeah, it's, what is that like 30 percent performance gain for like five thousand dollars? Like, no, that's terrible. But when five thousand dollars is paid off in a couple of months right, right. Or one project yeah one project yeah, or you're getting exactly. business from that person because you're able to finish faster and like all right. these things and if you told somebody oh i got 30 percent return in the stock market they'd be like how do i do that <laughs> yeah. it's such yeah. it's such different lines of communication and it's funny so the video that i'm doing uh for multi-frame rendering in collaboration with puget systems is i'm going to run a benchmark project probably kyle's uh across five different computers right my 2015 macbook pro which is still holding clinging to life uh, with not very good specs. And then my first ever PC build, which I think was like two grand ish. Like I, I kind of like went over my allotted budget, but that's like, I feel like kind of normal. And the one that I'm on now, which is a 2080 TI with a 3950X 16 core with 64 gigs of RAM, which is fine. And then the Puget system build, which is just, I think has like 512 gigs of RAM. Like I'm so stoked, <laughs> like just to like really run it through its paces. And it's, it's going to be the evolution of, what where people probably will step in their careers to like get to that next thing if you're making money doing stuff in after effects uh investing in yourself is the best option for you and yeah. i realize that not very many people can go out and spend six seven eight thousand dollars on a computer but if at the end of the year and you're doing your taxes you're like oh man i made 30 grand in freelance like okay let's reinvest in the business it's also a write-off which is great but like invest in yourself invest in the rig that you have because mm -hmm. it's gonna get you more work it's going to allow you the freedom to be more creative and all of these things and like you can learn and you can teach and you can pass that on to somebody else it's like yeah it never ends it's just like a full circle the whole time that's what i like about this stuff i mean i knew i wanted to be an editor when I was like 12 years old, like I've been, I've been cool. chasing this for long. I remember watching an Andrew Kramer tutorial and I was like, yep, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And like, I, I had it then. So if I can pass that on to somebody, um, that's, that's the ultimate goal, but yeah, stepping stones get to get to that place where the computer can outrun you. Cause there's so many times yeah. where I'm moving faster than the computer. Right. In a lot of ways, plugins doing whatever. and like trying to be creative and like you hit that wall and you're constantly pushing up against it. But if you can get a rig that can outrun your creativity, then it's just like it's it's let's play games at that point because like you can just do whatever you want. Yeah, and your project will probably be that much cooler for it, and you'll probably be a much happier person. Yeah. Well, and like you were saying before, you can experiment a lot more, which yeah. makes you a better you know motion graphics or VFX artist or whatever. And so it just improves your future work as well, which makes your time even more valuable, which mm -hmm. means you yeah. can charge more, right? Yep. Yes. And that's the, like, there's there's certain things that you do, right? Where it's like muscle memory when you open up a project. I would save those things to like good housekeeping, right? Create your folder structure, make, every, make sure everything's organized, do all that the same. But I would urge everybody um, who's listening in right now, next time you open a project, do something different than you otherwise would have. Like fight your muscle memory or like, your logical brain to do things in a certain order that you were taught because then you start to like really get cool results and you know bob ross happy little accidents or whatever like that happens all the time with this stuff and it's cool you know throw noise texture change the blend mode like do a bunch of stuff just do stuff it's really fun what you what you end up with and you can end up creating something really cool and unique at the end of it one of my uh, favorite little things that i have uh, i use a tool called kbar which is just a a, a Within After Effects, it's just a little panel full of buttons, and you put whatever you want on the buttons, um, other scripts or plugins or, or whatnot. Um, one of the favorite things that I have is a little script that uh, I actually asked a friend of mine, Zach Lovett, to uh, if it was possible. Um, and I was like, ah, maybe I'll try to figure it out. And he just did it in like five minutes because he's a <laughs> genius. Um, it adds a random effect to the current layer. And huh. if I'm ever just sort of bored, uh, whatever, I'll, I'll just create a solid and click that five times and see what I get and make something 
with that's it. cool um, it's a russian roulette of plugins <laughs> exactly and you know sometimes it's uh a, a catastrophe but it's um it's a great way uh john dickinson of uh, motion works uh had kind of a twitter thing he was doing similar to that a few years ago he just like you know, give you like two plugins, like advanced lightning and uh, whatever, some color effect that no one ever touches. And like, <laughs> put these two things on here, take 15 minutes, see what you can make. And it, it's the kind of stuff that you can learn when you just sort of play around like that. You're like, oh, wow, I never knew this worked like that. And you start discovering all these weird little hidden, uh, you know, possibilities in there. Yes. And now with multi-frame rendering, you can do that so much faster. <laughs> that color effect that was useless, <laughs> it's still useless, but it's faster now. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked a question. Hold on. That, that 2015 MacBook Pro is hanging on with fingertips. Is it a good benchmark for anything? Uh, yes, because that kid, right, whose mom or dad had a 2015 MacBook Pro yep. has now graduated onto the next one. That becomes a hand-me-down for somebody. And if you're at that age where you can start doing this stuff, it actually does have relevancy. So like that kid mm -hmm. that's going to inherit their parents former macbook pro and wipe it and put the new os on it and like want to experiment with after effects i feel like it does have some sort of relevancy uh, and that can be you know it's it's the gateway drug it's like okay well maybe now you're just spending all your time in after effects and at one point that kid's gonna have to ask their mom and dad for a better computer because this is what they want to pursue or will tighten the bootstraps and go out and get a job you know doing something so that they can afford a better computer like it's, Maybe it making videos from, for people. Yeah, it all it all starts from that point, right? It's yeah. it's very um, it's very interesting, and a lot of people ask me too on my YouTube channel. Well, how do I make money? Like, I don't know how to do. Like, okay, or it's either how do I make money, or how do I get stuff for my portfolio? Those are the two biggest things. Mm -hmm. And there's websites out there like Fiverr and all this stuff. Like, it, it doesn't sound like much, but go and offer your services for like fifty bucks. Somebody's going to pay it because they think that you're getting a good deal. And then you're also going to benefit from that because you're not only getting paid, it's a small amount, but you're getting paid. But now that project can go on your portfolio and you can start to kind of generate this little, you know, <laughs> portfolio is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> and it, it scales up from there, right? You do a couple $50 projects and then 75, and then you're at 150, then you're at 250, then you're at 500. Then you're like, it, it'll scale, you know. And then as, that becomes your day rate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you have to start somewhere and, and people want to start at a, you know, $750 project when they're like a entry level editor. And it's like, that doesn't, you can't really do that because you're going to scare people away. So you have to start small and work your way up. Yeah. And the 2015 MacBook Pro, like that's only six years old. Like I'm still amazed at how many people like we hear about, you know, cause we're obviously, you know, higher end and stuff, but I'm still amazed at how many people are coming to us and they're on like a, a trash can Mac, you know, mm -hmm. like, like a 2015 Mac Pro. And that's, you know, that's the same age. Yeah, you know, it's just laptop form of it. So I think that's a totally valid um, kind of a system to use as a comparison. I, I think that is probably on the older end, but that's why you're testing it is because it is, you know, a, a little bit older. It is going to be like a hand me down kind of a thing or, you know, someone who's just kind of getting started on it. Or what there, you're I totally agree. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a hand me down. It's just where, where do you start? Yeah. At yeah. what point do you pull the trigger and just start? And for a lot of people, it's it's shadowed by fear, and you can't be fearful. Yeah. If you can, if if all you can afford is a 2015 MacBook Pro, start there. You know, like yeah. it, it does have some sort of relevancy. And you know, it's it's certainly. Um, I think it's I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase this. Uh, all of this stuff is, uh, you know, kind of predicated on a certain amount of. I mean privilege, let's be honest, like to be able to afford a multi thousand dollar computer to be able to do this kind of stuff as a job, like that is a requirement to be able to do this job. Um, and to be able to bring that bar down a little bit and make the entry point a little easier for some people, even if it's not something where they can do top of the line, mind blowing work, but they can get into it and they can get started, get their feet under them and realize like, yes, this is the thing I want to do. Like I was making little videos on my phone and I wanted to add some effects. And then I realized like, now all this power is accessible to me. Um, and from there, it's really just a matter of like being able to do, you know, uh, work faster and do cooler projects and stuff. But kind of the sky's the limit there. Uh, once you understand the tools, um, it's just a matter of like how painful it might be on that old system. But to, to get accessible to people who might not otherwise have the tools to the stuff is, you know, that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, you still have to... sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I, was, I work in I work in the gaming industry professionally full time, right? It's I, I got into post production in a really like 
strange avenue. I moved out to Los Angeles to be a trailer editor, and then I started working for the UFC, and then for like a nutrition company, and now an esports organization. Like, it didn't go the way I planned, but it's still really cool. Anyway, uh, so the gaming industry. There's a lot of people out there that are streaming that want like custom overlays, which is all very motion mm -hmm. graphics. I mean, there's yeah. there's avenues that you can take those assets and sell them, license them for people to use and templates and like figure out how to make a template, sell it on Envato, right? Sell it on Video Hive. Like there's all these little things that you can do. And even if you're selling it for five dollars, if a hundred people buy that template from you, you just make five hundred bucks. That's cr like you know what I'm saying? Like it's more so than you make if it was just sitting on your hard drive. Yeah, it's just sitting there. And so even if you have a crap system. All you need it to do is work once on the final export and have everything make sense. And if, as long as it works once, then you kind of have like this passive income stream. And somebody said it's hard to get started. Yes. But the hardest part of getting started is getting started. Once you do it, then you're used to it and you can start, you know, hey, friend of mine, can you just download this thing and use it and give me a five star review? Because I need to get like the algorithm up or whatever. Like people do that all the time. You just have to be modest and be respectful don't try to cheat the system or anything but also just try to do good work that's really what it comes down to good work will get noticed at some point it might not be instantly but at some point it will get noticed yeah that's true i, I like that i like well sorry for the delay that i was i was meant to try and answer a question from youtube a little little on the slide behind the scenes um they were asking about if there was a, a very big difference between the 5800x and 3700x um rossi we have available um on our benchmarks page uh you're able to compare um of everybody who has used our benchmark um their results get uploaded with their specs and things like that so you're able to compare um those results sort of not quite side by side but if you just punch in 3700x you'll see the overall scores there and then you can punch in 5800x or look up the most recent article um for premiere and you can get those answers yeah on, on the subject of benchmarks i i also uh our after effects benchmark i'm trying to get it updated now to be able to better test multi-frame rendering because um and Kyle, we're going to be sticking your project in there. A little little <laughs> modified. I'm sorry to tell you, I've got to change some stuff because I don't want a giant like video clip plugged into the... Uh, or it's not yeah, I mean, thing. mine was intentionally designed to be kind of heavy so that it yeah. would work well as a, <laughs> yeah. a, a yeah, real yeah. benchmarking thing that didn't just take like a minute to render. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm going to be putting that in and we're making a few other tests because one of the problems with multi-frame learning for us as far as like testing goes is it made performance too good in some cases. Because, uh, like, if we're testing, uh, like, preview, if, like, five different systems can all do it in real time, like, that doesn't really tell you anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm also going to I'm having to go back and actually make some of our tests harder so that it doesn't just do everything in real time. Because, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that doesn't tell you anything. Sure. The real time stuff. So is hopefully really I'll have that working. update soon. Yeah. It's really good for working. But the export is really, like, the noticeable, huge, crazy difference that I've found. Even with yeah, uh, well, I was you guys before this, like I was, I was working on a project that was uh, red 8K raw footage from like a red Monstro, and so I graded it in DaVinci, came out like lossless out of DaVinci, and then brought it in After Effects to do all the keying. And I tried to do it in the normal After Effects build, not MFR. And I don't even. I'm, I'm assuming it does work on Keylight. I think it does. Yeah, or I think pretty much everything is supported now. Uh, during After the beta, Effects they added, added more and more. Yeah, but like yeah. I did it in the normal After Effects build, and for like a 20 second clip, it took two hours. And with multi frame rendering, it was like 40 minutes or something. It was great. Like I was saving so much, and I had to do a huge batch of footage. Like it was like 70 clips, and I was like, oh god. Uh, but yeah, I just let let it run overnight. My office was like a, a little furnace in here. My computer was just a space heater, but it ended up getting done in a lot shorter of a time than I thought, and it's great to just queue that stuff up. So nice. Yeah, right on. Cool, cool. Well, we are right at our hour. Um, Matt, do you want to try and answer this one about Premiere ever using more than eight cores just before we oh, go? Oh, yeah, sure it does. Yeah, uh, it just depends on what you're doing. Uh, but yes, yeah, absolutely. We, we sell like Threadripper systems fairly regularly for Premiere. Cool. Yeah. And I guess um, since we just right now perfectly at our hour, um, Kyle or Ian, is there anything else you'd like to mention or shout out or point people to um, before we sign off? Got to share your own stuff. You mm -hmm. got to promote yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, youtube.com slash learn how to edit stuff. If you want to learn how to edit stuff, uh, all sorts <laughs> of stuff. I do uh, After Effects and Premiere tutorials mainly like 95%. 
every once in a while, I'll switch it up and do a Lightroom or Photoshop tutorial in there, but mo mainly Premiere and After Effects. And uh, if you want to see my professional work, oneupstudios.gg uh, is the website. Just updated our... Hey, do you work for us? Sick. Um, but yeah, if you want to see my professional work, that's all there. My YouTube stuff is there. And uh, shout out you guys for having me on. This has been fun. I enjoyed talking to you and, uh, you know, talking to the community. It's always a, a good time. Uh, so let's see. Um, you can, uh, if you want to hear me talk more, you can often find me over in the School of Motion YouTube channel. Um, so uh, we do live streams over there semi-regularly. It kind of varies. Um, we don't have a schedule for them. Uh, you can hear me at Adobe Max next week. Um, if you are an editor who's kind of After Effects curious, uh, that is what my session is talking to you about, kind of showing you why you should be using After Effects and why it's uh, a lot less scary than you think. Um, if, uh, if you want to be uh, serious about learning about motion design, School of Motion is an awesome way to do it. Um, I would say that if I didn't work for them, I did for several years before I worked for them. Um, they have like, it's dedicated classes that you're doing for several weeks with a group of people. Um, and, uh, but they're very well worth it. And they can teach you like After Effects from the very basics and design for motion from the very basics if you want, all the way up to more advanced stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, if uh, I'm, I'm around on social media, I'm Kylosaurus Rex, um, sometimes with a dot, sometimes not or an underscore, I don't know. You'll figure it out. Um, uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions about things or want to just nerd out about After Effects. I like to do that. Yeah, aren't you even doing a, a brain date on Adobe Max? As yes, well? uh, that's good call. Oh, I am. Doing I almost signed up for it. I was like, no, I'll let people yeah. who are like actually do this stuff professionally. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they're doing a thing called Brain Date through Adobe Max, where you can you know kind of a meet the presenters thing. Uh, so one of them is like a group discussion. Uh, I forget what the limit is, but it's like up to 20 people almost. Um, so you can hop in that. And then there's some times available to do like a quick one-on-one -on -one with me if you just want to like ask some stuff about motion design or getting started with motion design or whatever. So um, again, you can find me, Kyle, you know, if you go to the Adobe Max site and search for my name, you'll you'll find my session. And, and I assume the brain date stuff is accessible through there as, as well. Yeah, I'm already signed up for your session, so you've got at least <laughs> one person who will show Great. up. <laughs> right on. Awesome. Well, thank I you, gentlemen. Well. It'll be the two of it. It'll be me and Matt in there. Yeah. <laughs> no. Great. We'll just heckle you the whole time. <laughs> I, I bring it on. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Um, if this was a lot of fun, this went really fast. I, I'm mm -hmm. kind of surprised that just because everybody was talking so well and just good conversation. We learned a lot today. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'd like to also thank the audience for joining us today as well. Uh, we This is our second day of our 2021 live stream extravaganza. We have a lot more coming up for you uh, throughout the rest of the week. Um, next, or not next week, tomorrow, I should say. Uh, let's see, it's Wednesday. We have State of the Industry, VFX and Motion Graphics, and also AI for post-production at 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Pacific, really respectively. So um, tune in for that. And uh, if you miss anything or want to look forward to the schedule, I've posted the link to our landing page for our extravaganza in the chat. And so thank you all very much. And um, we'll see you all next time. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thanks so much. <laughs>